Okay. Uh, well, okay. So we mentioned that the public key systems, you know, they rely on some trapdoor one-way function. Okay, here are the trapdoors in terms of the super-increasing knapsack. Okay, you have this multiplier M, and this modulus M converts the super-increasing into the general knapsack. If you don't have access to that multiplier, you just get to see this thing that looks like a general knapsack. There's no sort of obvious way to convert that back to the super-increasing. So that's the idea of the trapdoor. Um, okay, the one way, uh, that's kind of clear here, okay, it's easy to encrypt, hard to decrypt. However, this approach is insecure, okay, and very insecure. Uh, it was broken in 1983 by Shamir, okay. You remember Revest? What does Revest do? He makes them. What does Shamir do? He breaks them. Okay, so, got that. Okay, so he came up with this attack, and you know, an Apple II computer has essentially no computing power compared to what you have available today. So this is not computationally intense. It's a very straightforward uh, uh, attack. It uses a kind of interesting mathematical technique known as lattice reduction, which people had known about for a long time before this attack came along. It was used for some completely different problem, but Shamir just realized it would help to solve this particular problem as well. Uh, okay, so the bottom line here is what? How can we break this? I mean, my God, it's a super, you know, it's a general knapsack problem. Did we just solve an NP-complete problem here with an efficient algorithm? Okay, well, the catch is the general knapsack is not really the general case, right? What, is, what do you do in the general knapsack? You get a random selection of weights, okay? We didn't select a random set of weights here, right? How did we get these weights? We started with a super increasing knapsack and did something actually pretty simple. We did some modular arithmetic to get things that look like a super increasing knapsack, but they're not just generated at random. There's some structure underneath there, and that's what this attack is able to take advantage of. Okay, so, in other words, I mean, if you have a problem that's NP complete, you know, there's no efficient algorithm, that doesn't say there can't be special cases of it that are easy to solve. And this just happens to be a special case that's pretty easy to solve, okay? Now, the strange thing uh, about the knapsack is there are uh, versions of the knapsack. I mean, people understand the attack now and where the weakness lies here. People have actually come up with other versions of the knapsack that are... <laughs> uh, people have come up with versions of the knapsack, so-called so iterated uh, knapsacks, which are secure as far as anybody knows. Nobody's come up with efficient attacks on those. But yet people are unwilling to use those uh, more secure versions of the knapsack. Why do you suppose that is? They're suspicious. They're suspicious. Okay, I mean, there's sort of two reasons. The next one we'll talk about RSAs. It's good and does sort of everything you want. But still, anything that has the name knapsack associated with it still kind of leaves a bad taste in people's mouths. So they're kind of unwilling to use it. Uh, okay, RSA. This is the big one uh, as far as encryption and decryption in public, with public key systems uh, goes. And of course, RSA was invented by Cliff Cox, guy at GCHQ. This, uh, uh, he invented it a few years before Revest, Shamir, and Edelman reinvented it completely independently you know, working at uh, MIT. Um, so RSA really is the gold standard. I mean, it's the most widely used for encryption and decryption. Now, there are a few other systems out there that are specifically designed for digital signatures that get used a lot in that case, but for encryption, decryption, this is certainly uh, probably used more than all the other public key systems combined, okay? So, okay, now any public key uh, system has to be based on some underlying hard mathematical problem. Okay, now for the knapsack, what was that hard mathematical problem? The knapsack problem. It's a trick question. It's like who's buried in brain's tomb, okay? It's the knapsack problem. Okay, now for RSA, what's the underlying hard mathematical problem? Uh, it's factoring, okay? Now, given two primes, it's easy to multiply them together, but it's hard to factor them. These numbers are large. Okay? That's what we're relying on here for the security of this system. Okay, so here's the way it goes. 
So we're going to try and construct a public and private key pair for RSA. So here's what we have to do. We generate two large primes, P and Q. And then we form the product, N, which is this product of P and Q, and we call that the modulus. Now, a lot of times people call that the key, and in a sense it's sort of the key, but you know, to be precise, we should call it the, uh, the modulus. It's part of the key. Okay, now we choose a number E. Okay, so we know P and Q, right? We know N. Uh, we choose a number E that's relatively prime to this product, P minus 1, Q minus 1. All right? Because we know P and Q so we can form that product. Now we have to find, and how do we do that? How do you find a number that's relatively prime? Can we do that? Dumb question. What does rel relatively prime mean? Yeah, what does relatively prime mean? That's a good question. That means the two numbers have no factor in common. We went over this kind of quick mathematical review last time. So it's, uh, it's not that the numbers are prime, it's that they have no factors in common. Okay? So find such a number. It's actually computationally easy to find such a number. Okay? So not a hard thing to do. Once we have E, now we need to find a D so that this equation holds true. E times D is 1 mod P minus 1 Q minus 1. So, so what's D in terms of E? What do we call D here? What? It's the multiplicative inverse of E mod P minus 1 Q minus 1. Okay, that's the definition. Okay, they multiply together and get 1. Uh, it's also easy to find such a D. Uh, we mentioned that there's this algorithm, the Euclidean algorithm, actually, extended Euclidean algorithm that allows you to find such a number. Okay, so computationally, again, it's easy to do that. All right? Okay, once we have those numbers, we're good to go. The public key is going to be N and E, the modulus and the so called encryption exponent E, and the private key is going to be D, or the decryption uh, exponent. Okay. Uh, okay, so how do we encrypt? How do we decrypt? <coughs> okay, well, to encrypt a message, uh, a message M, uh, when you're going to encrypt, what do you know? You know the plain text, you want to encrypt M, and you know the public key. public key, okay? So what's the public key here? N and E. So all we get to use is N and E to try and encrypt this uh, uh, plain text. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the message M, we're going to raise it to the E power mod N, and we're going to call that the ciphertext. Okay, that's public key, right? E and N. So that's all we need to uh, encrypt the message. Okay, now, that's fine. We can always do that. That's just a mathematical operation, right? Now, how do we decrypt? Okay, well, here's what I claim. We can take this ciphertext up here, raise it to the D power, and who knows D again? It's private, so whoever has the private key is the only person who can decrypt because they have to have D to do this. They raise C to the D power mod N, and they're supposed to get back uh, the original message. Okay, so is it obvious to you that you can get the message back by doing this to the ciphertext? If it's obvious to you, you're a lot smarter than me because it's not at all <laughs> obvious to me that you can do this. Okay, so, so we'll have to actually do some work here to show that this uh, this does what it's supposed to do. So don't don't worry if it doesn't seem uh, clear at this point. But before we get to that, I just want to make a point here. Okay, so E and N are public. So Trudy knows E and N, right? What does Trudy want? What would Trudy really like to have? Plain text is good, but even better, <laughs> the private key, okay? D would be the best thing you could get if you're free. Well, okay, so if Trudy could factor N, what would she get? She would get P and Q. So if Trudy knows P and Q, she certainly knows P minus 1 and Q minus 1, and she knows the product, P minus 1 times Q minus 1. So if she can factor N, she can get P minus 1, Q minus 1, and she knows E. What does she need? She needs D, which is the multiplicative inverse of E mod P minus 1 Q minus 1. That's easy to find. Use the Euclidean algorithm and you get it. So the point is, if Trudy can factor in, she can get the private key. So factoring better be hard or else this is not going to do anything for you. Uh, now the interesting thing is, uh, factoring the modulus does break RSA, but nobody's 
proven that that's the only way to break RSA. It's conceivable there could be some other attack on RSA that would work as well, but you know, all the attacks you're ever going to see focus on factoring the modules. So, 